Good evening and welcome. Uh, tonight's meeting is a meeting, joint meeting between the Falmouth Board of Selectmen and the WTO Peak Committee that was formulated to build a consensus in the community in regard to wind turbines. Uh, before we get going this evening, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. Number one is that, uh, that uh, I'd like to thank each and every person that has served on this committee. The time, the effort, and uh, uh, the civility that you have displayed over the months and uh, I think it's 25 plus meetings that you had and I'm sure with additional time uh, it was extraordinary and uh, you should be commended as volunteers in the community and on behalf of the entire board I thank you for your efforts um, I'm sure there was some frustration <laughs> this evening the Board of Selectmen has has made a vote but I understand it's in agreement with the folks on your committee that we will not accept public comment this evening. We are planning next Wednesday to have a, a, an open meeting with the Board of Selectmen that would just be to, to solicit and take public comment. That meeting will be in the Board of Selectmen's room and that will be at 6.30 on next Wednesday evening. Um, for those folks who would like to come, we surely would ho hope to hear from each and every one of you uh, we may come up with a, a guideline on the amount of time that we're going to give everybody, but uh, that is to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to speak. Um, we are not going to try to uh, rush this process, although we are under somewhat of a, uh, a guideline and a timeline because the board has given a goal of having a warrant article prepared for the spring special town meeting and that would require us to have the article written and approved on our February the 4th meeting. Tonight's meeting will be conducted in accordance also with the Board of Selectmen speaker policy, which just provides for civility within uh, open and public meetings. So with that being said, I'm going to turn over tonight's meeting to uh, the coordinator, the uh, um, Stacy Smith, um, who will handle the meeting and, and we'll go from there. Thank you once again, appreciate it. Okay, thanks everyone. So welcome uh, on behalf of the wind turbine options process, um, welcome to the Board of Selectmen and thank you for coming to meet with our group um, to hear the final, uh, a presentation about the final report. So hopefully you all received that report this morning, early this morning. Uh, hopefully you've had some time to look it over. Um, what I'm gonna do is walk through the highlights of the report, um, just uh, for you and for the public, and then we're gonna try and spend time with questions and answers. And at that point, um, we have uh, some sitting in front and some sitting behind just for logistical purposes only, but um, all members of the, the group are welcome to answer questions. So, um, I'm just going to walk through the report, and I have a couple of extra copies of the report, but the report is available or will be available on the Wind Turbine website, the Wind Turbine Project website um, on CBI's website, and we'll get you that link if you don't have it. Um, and in addition to the report that we have here, uh, we also have all of the appendices uh, for all of you, one copy. Um, but they're also going to be on our website for download one by one. So if there's one that you want, you can just go right to it and, and download it. Okay. So, table of contents. We have an introduction overview in the report. We say a little bit about the need for action. We have a section about data collection and analysis. So what are the types of data that this group examined? and what are some of the conclusions that they came to. Uh, and then, most importantly, we have information about the packaged options, and this is the four options um, that the group really explored in detail and thought were promising to uh, put forward for the Board of Selectmen to consider further. Um, there are a couple other options that were considered but are not currently recommended. The report also includes a one-page statement from each stakeholder group um, to give additional opinions uh, and then a table of contents of the appendices and, as you've seen, 
a lot of additional information that came out of the process. So very brief overview of the process. Um, in January, the town of Falmouth uh, asked us, the Consensus Building Institute, as neutral facilitators, um, paid for by the Mass Clean Energy Center, to conduct an assessment and, if appropriate, to facilitate a process to seek a plan for the future of the town-owned turbines that would bring together all of the concerned people or representatives of the concerned groups uh, and key, of, of key stakeholders. So February and March, we conducted confidential interviews, focus groups, and email exchanges with 52 people um, trying to understand their thoughts and concerns about the future of the turbines. And in March and April, we drafted and revised a report on our findings and drafted and revised process recommendations based on the findings and based on input on a public, at a public meeting we had on April 12th. So we put out some draft findings to the people we interviewed. We revised them to make sure we got them right. Um, we put out draft recommendations. We had a public meeting, took input, and then revised those recommendations. And those led us to the process that we've undertaken for the last nine months. Um, so in April and May, uh, representatives self-selected to participate in the process. And it launched with its first meeting on May 30th. Um, and the neighbors joined the process. Neighbor representatives joined on June 19th. So between June and January, we met pretty much weekly, uh, sometimes twice a week lately. Um, we had a break in late August and a few other weeks off for different reasons. But we've had 25 total meetings, each of them somewhere between two and a half, three, sometimes slightly longer hours long. Um, so the group, as you've heard, have put in a tremendous amount of work on a very difficult issue. Um, all of the information, here's a, the website, um, cbuilding.org slash falmouthwind. You can go there for any of the, the materials from the process. So who, uh, who did we need to include in the process? We wanted to make sure that the core interests that we learned were out there in the town of Falmouth were all represented in this process. So that included um, the health, safety, and well-being of impacted neighbors, property rights and economic impacts on property owners, uh, reduction of fossil fuel generated electricity in order to reduce the negative impacts of emission on climate, environment, and health, the fiscal impacts on the town's residents and town services, and an amicable end to the conflict that divided and challenged the town's relationships and reputation. So these were the range of, of interests that people held most strongly when we interviewed them to find out what do people really care about, what's really important. And so when we brought the group together, we realized that we needed to try and find outcomes that could address, at least to some extent, all of these concerns. So that was our, our task. So on the committee, we had five residents who uh, experienced adverse impacts of the turbines, um, both health impacts and economic concerns about economic impacts. Um, we had two residents who were primarily concerned about climate action protection plan and about climate action in general. Um, two residents who were primarily concerned with the fiscal benefits and the impacts on the town. Two residents who had strong empathy for all perspectives, who could really help be advocates for a fair process and try and help bridge gaps and differences. And then we also had three represent, representatives of relevant town departments. And all of these groups either self-selected or went through a public process to, to select their representatives. We also had two selectmen um, join us as liaisons at almost all of the meetings and sit through the meetings and answer questions when needed. Um, we also had Mass CEC at all of the meetings as a liaison. Um, we also had technical expertise that was provided by Mass CEC, by uh, uh, their contractors, Ascentec, DNV, Kima, and Sustainable Energy Advantage, and also from DEP and town employees, 
provided additional information and technical uh, expertise and facilitation provided by the Consensus Building Institute primarily by me and my trusted assistants who helped make sure all the uh, meetings were well documented. So there's been some misunderstanding on what the purpose of this group was. It was really never, uh, uh, the purpose was really never to reach consensus. Um, it became clear from the initial interviews that that was going to be a pretty high bar to meet um, and probably not the most likely outcome. Um, but the goal really was to come together to have a shared understanding of the information of what might, hap what might be possible and what would happen if you took those different roads. So that's really been the job of this group. So they have had to make decisions together and reach consensus on a lot of things, not on what the ultimate decision would be for responding to the turbines, but decisions about, through the process, which experts to use, what information to ask for, how to treat that information, what to do with it, right? Uh, methodologies to use, and uh, ultimately what to put in this report. So. Um, except where specified, the report reflects the consensus views of the group. So what were their tasks? Um, to develop a widely acceptable shared history of events. Um, that wasn't something we spent time on together as a group, but the group did work behind the scenes to compile a timeline that everybody could accept was valid um, and, and, and I put a copy of all of that. That's in the appendix, but it's a little bit buried in the appendix, so I uh, printed a, a copy of that for all of you here for tonight. Um, clarify the range of potentially acceptable long-term options. Identify the questions that would need to be answered about each of these options in order to make sure we understand how feasible they are, how much they would cost, what the benefits would be, what the impacts would be to find legitimate methods for getting answers to those questions to the extent possible, jointly review and interpret the data that comes back, and then to evaluate the options, again, their feasibility, their cost, their benefits, their impacts, to do that together based on the new information. Um, and the information that, you know, some of the information was information we just had to pull together and examine, some of it the, the group had to commission and get uh, developed for them and then get revised and all of those things. They went through a lot of process around this data. So I, I can say these are the tasks we set out f uh, for ourselves from the beginning and I think the group um, was remarkably successful at achieving them. So this is just in a nutshell the data collection and analysis section of the report. and. We're not going to walk through that here tonight, um, but that's really for your information. Um, as you dig into the appendices, you'll see we collected a whole lot more information as well, um, some of which is referred to in here. Um, there's also a lot of information that we didn't collect and that we didn't examine together, and that's mentioned in the report as well. There, despite all of the time we spent together, there were still a lot of limits to, to what we could do. Um, but this, this was all um, data that was important for the group to examine. Some of it uh, they found more credible and legitimate than, than others, other pieces of data. And in your reports, you have not only what the data was that they collected, but it also has their conclusions about that data, how credible it was, how useful it was, what they, would, what they then took forward in their analyses. So the heart of the report, the packaged options. Um, as I said, there's really four options that the group uh, is putting forward. Um, one is full operation of the turbines. Um, we'll get into details on each of these. Um, the second is curtailed operations, and there's two pieces to that. One is a break-even curtailment scenario, and the other is a 12-hour curtailment scenario. So they looked at these two different uh, curtailment options. And then the third is removal of the turbines or removal of the turbines combined with replacement of a photovoltaic array. 
So that's what I'm going to spend most of the, my presentation talking about. So full operation. Um, in this option, the turbines would be operated whenever wind conditions allowed, without curtailment. And homes would be purchased, or uh, noise easements would be acquired where noise levels exceed DEP guidelines. Uh, in addition, there are homes, uh, you'll see as in the data section, the group understood that um, homes that DEP guidelines, where DEP guidelines were not exceeded, were still, people in those homes uh, were still having difficulty with the turbines. Right? They, the, the noise and health concerns are not resolved if you meet DEP guidelines. So for those homes, the town could voluntarily purchase residences um, based on predetermined eligibility criteria to make sure that decisions are fair and predictable. And the, the group offers a couple of examples of some of those criteria, but that would really be for the board to put together, figure out what those criteria would be. Um, in order to address uh, property value concerns, um, the town might also offer some quantity of financial compensation to residents within a certain distance or offer a property value guarantee. Again, the group thinks it'd be very important to have clear criteria if you were going to do any of those things. Um, the group also suggested that you might want to have someone, uh, a neutral person who can help implement um, making sure that those are, are managed in a way that is fair and, and equitable and defendable. Um, and the group recommends that if this op option is selected, that the town take measures to ensure that operation of the turbines complies with required DEP noise guidelines. So for each option, I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about the different impacts. Right? Um, so the energy impacts of this. Um, the group went through quite a bit uh, of work with their expert consultants to arrive at an estimate of energy production. Um, and the estimate varies, will vary tremendously from year to year in actuality. This is an average, given an average, uh, average wind <coughs> year. Um, and there's uncertainties in that in the calculation as well. But the number they arrived at was uh, 7,513 megawatts per year would be generated by the two turbines together, operating together uncurtailed. Um, so this gives you a five-year cumulative estimate and an 18-year cumulative estimate. And 18 years is used throughout the report um, because it's the uh, counting on the 20-year lifespan of the turbines. So what would be the financial impacts of this option? Well, the group looked at two different scenarios when they were looking at financial options, financial implications. Um, one of those required the rebuilding of a $1 million reserve fund, which uh, the town had at the outset of this project by pre-selling um, some of the Wind One Rex um, renewable energy credits to the Clean Energy Center. So because of that contract, you started with a $1 million uh, reserve fund. Um, that reserve fund has been um, used. A lot of that reserve fund has been used over the past two and a half years. And so uh, there was a request from the town to rebuild that reserve fund. So um, in each scenario, in each financial analysis, the group examines um, what the implications would be if you rebuilt that reserve fund over a five-year period, um, and what would happen if you didn't need to rebuild that reserve fund for whatever reason, if you had other money for it or if the town felt comfortable uh, contributing less to a reserve fund or, or some other uh, way to see that happen. So um, if the, there were contributions of $130,000 a year to a reserve fund for the first five years, then uh, you would expect 
this is your a average estimate. If all your years were average years and the, and the um, estimates are correct, you would be somewhere, you would have somewhere around $1.3 million um, in revenues above and beyond costs um, in five years. Right? And in 18 years, you would have somewhere in the ballpark of $7.7 million in revenues. Um, if you didn't contribute to the reserve fund, there would be more in revenues because that, that money wouldn't be being put into reserves, so it would be instead uh, in, in the cash flow bucket, so those numbers increase. Now, in this scenario, that's not the only costs, right? The costs include uh, property purchases um, and any compensatory measure, measures that the town might take to resolve the additional noise and health and property value concerns that people have raised. So the group really uh, did an initial look at how do we estimate those numbers and realized that it was really going to be beyond their ability to estimate um, because it was they were unable to estimate the number of homes where turbine noise might exceed DEP guidelines. Um, they agreed that additional testing would be needed to figure that out. Do we have questions we want to ask them as we go through? Or it, it might be beneficial for the board because- Do you want to ask questions as you if go? That's all right, uh, because- Absolutely. That way they won't lose track and yeah. you Just, won't lose- yeah. quick, A quick minor point, with the full contributions to reserve fund, yeah. you would also have $600,000 in a reserve fund you in would. that, so that's- those right, so at the end here, you really might fun. have some money left over, or mm -hmm. you might have used it. Okay. Because uh, the idea of the re reserve fund is that you might need it. Okay. Great. Um, but yes, assuming all else is equal, you'll have that money back here at the end. Great, thank you. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, when it discusses available revenue surplus from turbines, does that take into consideration the 120000 a year O&M? Yes. Thank you. It does. All the options. Uh, take into consideration the operation and maintenance costs, they take into consideration the bonds, they take into consideration the energy at the wastewater treatment plant, um, and, and, and more, right? They, they had a very rigorous analysis of all those things. So uh, the additional costs, unfortunately, the group cannot give you a very good picture of what those would be. Um, it's really going to be more work for the board to figure that out. Uh, if you wanted to go forward with this, with this approach. Um, both what you would legally be required, homes who would be legally required to purchase. Um, so far, DEP has said at least one. Um, and the group has been unable to come up with any other number beyond that. They tried looking at different noise models, and the conclusion they came to is additional testing is required to get at that number. In addition, um, there'll be a lot of, uh, of people with health and safety and, uh, and, and, and other concerns um, that haven't been addressed even once you purchase those you are legally required to purchase. So uh, if the town wants to resolve those concerns, um, that would probably involve more home purchasing. Um, so, um, and any additional monetary compensation for property values the town might want to use. So this is really only a partial picture of the financial impacts of this option. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just try and present and then we'll, okay? So if you have questions, you can ask. All right, so what are the impacts on neighbors uh, of this option? Well, relocation would resolve health and noise concerns for all of those whom are re, who are relocated, whose homes are purchased, um, but it would impose quality of life costs. Um, neighbors have said they do not want to leave their homes. This is not their op this is not their choice. This is not what they'd like to do. So um, while it it would remove them from the problem they are facing living near the turbines, it is not uh, what they see as a very positive solution to their problems. Um, and if there are those that the town, w whose homes the town does not purchase, or compensatory measures don't respond, um, then uh, those those people would feel that this package provides no solution to their concerns. Um, the group did not look at uh, 
anything about property value losses, whether they're really likely, whether they're real, what they might be. Um, so again, that would um, that would still be something that the, the board might want to look further into. Um, and uh, but those who did not receive any compensatory measures would feel that it provided no solution for them. So, and there's, you know, much more, this is a summary, there's much more information about this in the report. Um, what are some uncertainties? Um, well, the financial projections and the production estimates are, are, are uncertain. Uh, they're, they're the best guess that the group could get from the expert, and the experts did several iterations to try and get to this best guess. Um, but actual production levels in any given year will most certainly vary from this estimated, uh, you know, average in any case, right? And um, if you wanted to get a 95% confidence interval of how likely you are to be at the production numbers that we've said, you could get up and, up and down 21% in any given year from that number, right? Um, you don't know the, the actual cost and the actual number of properties that need to be purchased or the ones that you would voluntarily purchase. Um, the group also noted there may be future changes to noise guidelines and policies. There may be potential for future legal action um, because th there are neighbors who might be dissatisfied um, and uh, potential for health regulations or any other kinds of things that might later change the, the operational space you have for um, running the turbines. So these are some of the uncertainties the group wanted to note. Um, and actions needed would be comprehensive additional acoustical measurements. Um, the group recommends that any additional acoustical measurements be conducted using a firm and methodology acceptable to all stakeholders. And there's additional information, um, suggestions from the group about how to do those studies. They, they were not uh, full consensus of the group about, about those. Um, uh, and, and that there's an offer on the table, uh, as far as the group understands, from MassEC to do some of those additional acoustical studies that the group recommends following up on availing yourselves of. Um, depending on the number of properties uh, to purchase and the total cost to the town, it seems likely that additional money will be needed. Um, and so moving this package forward would require that a, a funding commitment for that amount of money. And the, the group recommends that the town seek the value of the additional costs for home purchases and other mitigations from the state or from other sources once you've determined what that amount is. Other questions about uh, full operation? What it, what's entailed in this package from the Board of Select? Am I doing okay, group? Did I miss anything important? Okay. Uh, of course, I wasn't at the meet at, at the table of the last meeting, but I I was certain that Tony Rogers from DMV FEMA <coughs> said that there would be twenty to forty homes. Uh, that yeah. So we can talk them. about that after, Malcolm. Oh. So you you did hear that the group didn't think that that was data that that uh, warranted their. Um, stamp to okay, go into this right, report. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next option is break-even curtailment. Um, the heart of this option is to oper operate the turbines such that the projected revenue produced by the turbines is equal to the projected costs. So the goal here, the group said, um, okay, what's the least amount we can run these turbines and still um, you know, pay our bills. That's what they were looking to do here. So this is the only option that doesn't require an influx of additional money, right? Um, so uh, it doesn't have any additional measures to respond to noise, health, and property value concerns. It does have some curtailment, which is meant to respond to noise, health, and property value concerns, or at least noise and health concerns. Um, and again, there's the two scenarios with and without the reserve fund. Um, and the group, they looked at 
the first five years and the second five years. Um, and the, the first five years changes what amount of curtailment you can do, uh, depending on whether you have the reserve fund requirement or not, right? Because that influences how much free cash you have to reduce turbine operations. So if you have to contribute to the reserve fund during that first five years, you could curtail the turbines from 11 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. Plus, uh, at certain times during the early mornings when flicker is expected. Um, so that would be a curtailment of both turbines during that first five years, right? Um, if you didn't have to contribute $130,000 a year to a reserve fund for the first five years, you could curtail from 10.30 p.m. to 7 a.m. plus curtailing for flicker, right? So you can see that um, if you had that million dollars from somewhere else or you didn't have a requirement to have that million dollars in reserve, um, you could do significantly more curtailment during that first five years. In the second five years, regardless of whether you've built up reserves in the first five years, um, you can curtail from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. It's slightly less time than in the first five years because revenues decrease slightly. Um, for a number of reasons, uh, and you can dig into the financials for that. But um, you know, beyond the, the second five years, again, numbers sort of change, but the group sort of felt like looking out further than 10 years into the future was just a little too fuzzy and probably not that useful right now. Um, but it gives you a sense of the idea of the scenario and the kind of curtailment you could expect. Um, what would the energy production be? It's estimated to be 5,078 megawatts per year. That is in the second five years. So you can, we can, go, you can go through and figure out what it is in the different scenarios, but for simplicity's sake, um, in the second five years, you would have about that much, and um, this would be the uh, five-year and 18-year cumulative estimate. So how would this impact neighbors? Well, the, the affected neighbors representatives to the group indicated that curtailment does not, in, this in, in, curtailment that does not include a full night would be insufficient to reduce the impacts of sleep loss, particularly for children who sleep longer, right? So even 1030 to seven might be insufficient if your kids go to bed at seven. Um, some neighbors have also stated that temporary relief from operation does not lead to significant improvements in health and quality of life. Uh, nonetheless, others felt that this option may improve the health and quality of life for some neighbors because sleep deprivation will be addressed at least to some degree and sleep deprivation was the um, most prevalent complaint for those who uh, presented at, to the Board of Health. So um, especially in the hours where ambient noise is the lowest, those early hours of the night uh, and morning, or early hours of the morning, um, the value of this option to neighbors' health increases as the hours of curtailment increase. It does offer relief from shadow flicker because all of them uh, include curtailment for shadow flicker. And the group didn't investigate whether curtailment would have any influence on property value concerns. What are some uncertainties? Well, again, financial projection uncertainties. Um, questions about whether there might be exceedances of DEP noise guidelines during the hours that hadn't been tested yet, that the turbines might still be operating. Um, so like 4.30 in the morning till 9 a.m. I think hadn't yet been tested, or 7 a.m.? Outside of those hours, right? Anything outside of those hours and outside of the curtailed hours, um, there was some potential uh, that there could still be exceedances of DEP noise guidelines. if The two turbines are running together, um, and again, uh, some of these potential changes and legal action, um, and also changes in the cost of electricity 
uh, could also this the the um, financial projections include uh, some assumptions about how electricity pr prices will change over time. So um, again, you can't really know now exactly what's going to happen um, in the future. So if those change, then that would change your um, cost and benefit uh, analysis. Yeah. One question um, in regard to shadow flicker. Yeah. Any idea of the amount of time of in a year we would talk about shutting off for shadow flicker? Yeah, it's, the, it, was predict, it was predicted to be less than 1% okay. of the time. Great. So actions needed, um, comprehensive additional acoustical measurement conducted during these hours that hadn't been tested that the turbines might still be running. Um, and you would need financial support, um, either to replenish the reserve fund, forgive the rec contract, and uh, or, or um, allow and uh, or or you know some other source in order to if you wanted to have any additional curtailment. So you don't require financial additional financial assistance for this option, but if you were to get some more, you would get a lot. You would get more curtailment, right? And the more curtailment you can get, the better this option looks for neighbors health and well-being and sleep. So the next curtailment scenario that was looked at was 12-hour curtailment. And just to let you know, the group really looked at a wide range of different curtailment options and what they might do. They looked at different you know, wind conditions and, 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 and other things like that. Um, and these were the two that seemed to have the most value um, in terms of maximizing people's in interests and needs. So 12-hour um, curtailment is what you have now, right? And this is the estimated uh, energy impacts, 3,758 megawatts of um, electricity, megawatt hours would be generated per year. So what's the financial implications? Um, well, they're, they're in the red. Um, again, with the two scenarios, um, with, with reserve funds, the five-year cumulative estimate is um, you would be, have a gap, a funding gap of 1.3 million, um, and over 18 years, a funding gap of 2.4 million. Um, without contributions to reserve fund, those, those numbers are smaller. So what is the impact for neighbors? Um, some neighbors, while this does allow for sleep, um, some neighbors have still said that temporary relief does not lead to significant improvements in health and quality of life. Um, uh, given the prevalence of complaint related to sleep, some members feel that nighttime curtailment should offer significant improvement for many neighbors concerned about health and quality of life. Um, it offers relief from shadow flicker, and again, the group didn't look at whether it has any impact on property values. And just to let you know, as, we, as the group tried to analyze neighbor impacts, they relied primarily on uh, the representatives of the affected neighbors who were participating in the process, but they also, in part, relied on uh, a survey that the group had done. They relied on the complaint logs and the testimonies at the Board of Health. Um, and they relied on their own personal relationships with people who live in the area um, who, who might, they might be talking to and getting uh, opinions from. So this is not scientific. Um, uncertainties, again, financial projections. Um, potential changes and potential legal action, but in addition, um, finding, the, finding the financial resources to make up that gap. So the next steps would be uh, additional acoustical measurement might also be uh, worthwhile for the hours the turbine would be running that have not yet been tested, um, which are 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Um, and a commitment of a funding source to cover that gap. 
So the, the group recommends that the town seek financial support from the state or other sources. Um, and over 18 years, this is estimated uh, to be $2.4 million if they need to, to replenish that million dollar reserve fund. Yes. Yes. Um, each one of the scenarios you've, or options you've talked about before has talked about the fiscal impacts, the energy impacts, and what's the third one? Neighbors. Neighbors, Neighbors impact. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the core interests is not addressed throughout. Right. And uh, we put a, a footnote, if, in effect, um, in the need for action section. Yeah. Um, can I just read that? So that, because to me that underscores everything that we worked on. And yet it's not been addressed in, in any of the presentations so far. Um, it, it's a, it's, it was a statement that was made in the beginning, but the selectmen haven't necessarily read that. Okay. You want to read it? Um, okay. It said that um, in its evaluation of each option, the report analyzes the potential impact of the option on each of the core interests except community reunification. While this group lacks the information to quantify the impacts of individual options on this unity, there has nonetheless been a core concern underlying the discussions throughout this process and that the WTOP can say with confidence it was their sincere effort to pursue this goal when developing this report. But it was the least quantifiable. Yeah. But it's not been mentioned thus far on the need of the packages. Yeah. So, I just so the reason it's not analyzed, so as you heard at the beginning, there were the five uh, sets of, of interests, and one of them was town unity, right? And the group had no ability to uh, measure that. right? How well will this solve town unity? How well will that sound to so solve town unity? Part of that's going to be your job, <laughs> or town meeting's job, or whatever other way you want um, to use to try and quantify that. Um, the group, it was beyond the, the capacity of the group to do. OK. Um, turbine removal and, and uh, turbine removal and PV purchase. So this option is a combination of two otherwise distinct components removal and sale of the turbines, and development of a photovoltaic array. Um, these could be done separately. Um, but the group examined them together primarily because, as we said, their goal was to try and address, at least to some extent, all of the interests. And only by combining them do you address, at least to some extent, all of the interests. Um, so uh, if you take down the turbines and uh, sell them, Clearly, there'll be no operation. Um, if you include a photovoltaic project, uh, they looked particularly at a, at a two megawatt photovoltaic array that might be put at the, at the town um, landfill or another site. But they started looking there. Um, and that if you did this, uh, all noise, health, and property value concerns about wind one and wind two would be resolved. Um, if you do turbine removal and no photovoltaic array, you have zero renewable energy production on a yearly basis. If you put up a two megawatt photovoltaic array, um, the output is estimated at 2,393 megawatt hours per year. Right? And there's a 25 year uh, life expectancy of a photovoltaic array, so um, this instead of being 18 years now goes to 25. So I'm going to walk through the financial impacts of take down the turbines alone, put up the photovoltaic alone, and then do them together so that you'll see those. And that's how it's laid out in the report. So uh, turbine removal alone, um, these are the components. There's the debt, um, the two bonds for wind one, um, the stipulated refund for the Mass CEC rec contract, remember the million dollars you got up front. If, you then don't, if they don't get to generate the recs, um, then you have to pay them back that money. Um, and so this is sort of what it would cost if you, if you built it out over 18 years. If you paid it up front, it would be less than this. But, um, and that may be true of the debt, too, but we're not really sure how that's structured as bonds. Um, electricity at the wastewater treatment facility, again, um, the sort of marching orders were that the group had to consider how that gets paid for, um, which it's currently paid for by the turbine operation. So if you took down the turbines, 
you would need to account for that money. Um, so it's put in here in this financial analysis. And then there's an assumption of resale, um, and there was some analysis done on what the resale value might be. Um, and the assumption was somewhere between $200,000 and $600,000 uh, you could get. And that would include uh, the cost. They would come and take it down and move it. So they would pay for that. So you wouldn't have to pay to take it down or move it. They would pay to do, your buyer supposedly would do that and would pay for, uh, pay you some amount for the, the turbines. So that gives you uh, your um, estimates um, depending on whether it's 200,000 or 600,000 or somewhere in between, you're sort of in this range um, over five years of 2.4 to 2.8 million gap. Um, and over 18 years, which is the project completion, um, the total amount is somewhere between 9 million and 9.4 million dollars that would be required. Um, and, and that is the, the assumption now the group has, knowing that uh, the contract for closing the, the um, Win 2 um, era money is just a matter of some paperwork. So there's the assumption of, of the group that that does not need to be considered. Um, photovoltaic Can we purchase. Go back to that slide yeah. Can you go back to that slide yeah. just again. So and, and you're a little confusing when you okay. have the five year versus the 18 year. Yeah, so 18 years is your total. But, but the bottom line is that if we remove them, yep. and the financial impact means if we go and we need to borrow the money, what would be the sum that you, you're, you're showing this the bottom one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you had some of that money up front, this number might be lower, right? Because th this assumes it takes you the 18 years to do it. Yeah. It does not take into consideration still when we get in touch with the state they may even cooperate at some point that's not even right, right. I mean, they were complicit in this exactly so, so yeah. that's part of the this is okay. the if you've got no help right gotcha. the group isn't assuming this the town has to pay this right the group is saying this is the cost thank you you got to get the money from somewhere and you could call it five hundred thousand a year yeah. can you say that again Doug? you could call it five hundred thousand a year right? it's gonna be a, yeah. either that or you'd have to bond it right And if you bonded it, it would be, if you paid it up front less, then it would be less right. for the upfront cost, but then you'd have the interest. Right? It's still 500. Yeah. Okay. So, photovoltaic array. Uh, the group was assuming, as I said, it, um, a 20 year, you got a 20 year municipal bond of $6 million at a rate of 3.75%. You see, they got kind of detailed here. Um, Solar recs actually are selling for uh, quite a bit more than wind recs, but you got to act fast. Um, so for the first 10 years, you, you might be able to get something in, in the uh, realm of $150 a rec, um, as opposed to the $40 a rec that uh, you get from wind. And um, so for the first 10 years, this assumes the 150 Afterward, assumes 40 Again, all of this is none of this is certain. These are all assumptions. Um, so an all-inclusive, and they're assuming, just based on uh, research into what these things seem to be costing, uh, they're assuming about a $3 per watt all-inclusive development capital costs and 14.5% capacity factor for the energy. So. Um, this would then, over five years, if you were to do this, get your bond um, and put up your array, you would expect the revenues from the photovoltaic energy to produce uh, $1.3 million over five years, the first five years. And over the 25-year uh, lifespan, um, something like $5.8 million. Right? And this would be a standalone photovoltaic project. Okay, now here's the combined, right? The group was uh, really intrigued by the idea of combining these, both because there's revenue that comes from the photovoltaic project that could help to pay for some of the costs of removing the turbine, 
and the energy that you get from the photovoltaic project um, can in some ways uh, replace the lack of renewable energy that you will be losing from taking down the turbines. So it, it has those two potential benefits um, on the fiscal side and also on the energy side, right? So um, the group wanted to first look at, okay, how much, how much uh, is the difference between um, paying all the costs uh, for the photovoltaic array itself and its development and the bond for the photovoltaic array and its operation and maintenance and all of that, and all of those costs we went through for taking down the turbines. Um, and then you add in the revenue from the photovoltaic array. So now you have, in your base case, a five-year cumulative um, estimate of there's still a gap of 1.6 million. And it's a smaller gap than if you don't also do the photovoltaic array and you just take them down. But there's still a gap, right? And over 25 years, the gap is about $4.6 million, right? Now, then the group thought, well, what if somebody helped subsidize the cost of the photovoltaic array? What if you got some help? Um, so first they looked at, well, they looked at a whole bunch of different cases. But they wanted to present to you this case, which was um, a case in which by the end of the 25-year life of the project, you break even, right? Um, so after 25 years, uh, if you got $3 million up front toward the capital cost, so that is instead of $6 million in capital costs, you only had $3 million in capital costs, um, you would have negative years, right, which you would have to figure out how to pay for. But you would also have positive years, and by the end, you would have a positive uh, cash flow project. Um, however, the group realized that that's not easy, like you still have to pay those negative years. So what would it take in upfront money to make sure that you didn't have negative cash flow throughout the life of the project? And the estimate for that was $3.9 million. And you would have to get that $3.9 million upfront, put it in a reserve fund, um, and use it to pay for those downtimes when, when the project is in the negative. You draw out of the reserve fund to pay those costs. Did the group ever look at putting the photovoltaic together with one of the, or two of the other options, i.e., the curtailment option, so that you could curtail for a lot, lot, lot more and then uh, add photovoltaic? The group, that ever looked at? Yeah, the group didn't examine that, but I think they're open. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay. the, the information you would need to examine that is all in the report. Okay, thank you. So the board can certainly look at that. So um, neighbor impacts, as we said, fully resolved. Um, uncertainties. Well, you don't know exactly how much you could sell them for or how long it would take and all those things. Um, the actual capital cost, capacity factor, SREC price, all of those things for the PV array, all the, the financial assumptions, um, there's uncertainties there. Um, the likelihood of receiving upfront financial support to help pay for this is also an uncertainty. Um, the timeline for town meeting approval of the borrowing um, and timeline for the development, permitting, grid co connection, installation, et cetera. All of these are uncertainties that come with this. Um, and so what would you need moving this forward? Uh, you would need a funding source for the photovoltaic capital costs and or wind one uh, debt obligations. Um, the group uh, just clarified if you pursue just removing the turbines, you would need uh, somewhere in the range of 8.9 to 9.3 or 9, 9 million dollars, 9 to 9 and a half million dollars. If you are looking to do both, uh, this combination, the amount of money you're seeking is 3.9 million dollars, right? But that's not money you can, that's, uh, in, a, in addition, you would also be getting, having this bond and paying off the bond and the $3.9 million would help you stay even. Right. So the group would recommend that the town seek financial support uh, from the state or other sources for those. 
Okay, a couple things the not con that were considered and not recommended. And I have to say, when we started the process, you know, it's very, the, the group actually didn't have that much trouble agreeing to put all these on here. But when I did the interviews, there were people who loved these ideas, one or more of these ideas, and were completely convinced that they could work and solve the problem. So this is one, of, this page, though it's small and the section of the report is small, to me is is a success of this group that we shouldn't overlook, which is we've figured out what isn't going to solve the problem, right? We've all agreed these things are probably not going to solve the problem, right? So berms and barriers just weren't practical. They weren't likely to really solve uh, the, the neighbor's problems. They were going to be too expensive. They were going to be too tall. They just weren't going to work. Um, mechanical alterations um, seemed promising in theory, but they don't exist to be currently purchased and used. Um, they would primarily be research projects. And the group felt we can't really consider those. The town can't really, we certainly don't feel like we can consider those and we don't recommend to the town that that's how we try to solve the problem at this time. Um, moving the turbines to another location, the group did a lot of work looking into how they might do this. There's more uh, in the data section of your report that really explains all of the things they looked at. They identified one potential site. Um, that site uh, still had some serious problems, um, including its proximity to not Falmouth residents, but um, base housing on MMR. Um, and they checked with the FAA, and the FAA said that it, uh, it, it constituted a hazard to put the turbines there. So um, based on those things, uh, the group felt right now moving the turbines, they, they didn't really see how that was a very viable option. And uh, lastly, legal action against engineers and contractors. Um, this was raised as something to cons for the group to consider um, as a way of uh, recouping financial um, resources to solve these other, to, to use toward the solution. Um, and the group agreed that as a public forum, th that would not be a place to try and examine th those kinds of things. So the group was able to, to uh, put that aside for, for the purposes of their recommendations. And I believe that brings me to the end. I'm going to open it up to uh, any questions. For for me or for the group? Um, I have two questions and I'll direct them to you and maybe you'll pass it on to the group. Okay. Do you think there's agree agreement among the group as to which location would most likely experience exceedances? No. Which one location? Okay. Like one location meaning house yeah. or location? House. Well, I think, you know, people agree on what DEP found, though they don't all agree that DEP's methodology was the one DEP should have used. Um, but I think beyond that, uh, there's not very much agreement about other exceedances or other locations. Okay, and you had mentioned something in, in your report that uh, when uh, Chairman Murphy asked a question, that the idea of combining project options is something that we can consider. And I want to make sure the group is aware that that may very well be where we have to go. And I hope that with the amount of work they put into it, that they're understanding that it can't necessarily be one thing that they propose, but it may need to be a combination. Yeah, I mean, I think the group wanted to make sure that the board had all the information you needed on the range of options that they thought seemed most likely. Um, and with that information, you know, even in the report, there are places it says the board might consider other curtailment options. The board might consider, you know, other ways of doing this. So. Um, I think they understand that, that you know, and they, they certainly don't agree on any of those options. There's nothing in this report that the whole group says, yes, do this, right? Piece, parts of the group like different options differently. Anybody else? Yeah, Karen. But we do all want the problem solved as community mm -hmm. members. So if you can do that. Mm -hmm. I think we'd all be in agreement with that. Amen. There's a, very often in, the, in, in, in government we see that when you solve a problem, it's you know, virtually impossible to, to 
please each and every constituent. Uh, it, it's hard to do in your own households and your own families, never mind in an entire community. Is there a feeling that the compromise and a solution uh, is possible? Because there's going to be have to be give and take on both sides if there is that. Um, otherwise, there will be, if someone wins, the other groups will be disenfranchised because they will get nothing as well. So I, I just, I'll start by saying um, the options presented all attempted to address the key concerns to some extent, right? None of them completely ignore concerns, right? So, um, but they clearly don't adequately resolve all the concerns in all the cases, right? So there's trade-offs built in. Yeah. Um, I would just like to say that I think, I'd like to think that at this point, we're beyond sides. We don't want to use that word anymore. Um, we really want to come together as a community. This is our problem for all of us here to resolve. And so, you know, I would ask everyone, and it's all of us in Falmouth who are involved in this, to um, um, put us, try to put aside preconceived notions and ideas uh, and use common sense to bring us together and, and, and to move us to a place where, yes, there is not going to be total agreement, but uh, I think we can do it. I think we can work together and do it. Any other comments? We're going to have an open public hearing, but this is a time for these two groups to sit here and talk specifically. Are there any other comments from you folks who've served or whatever constituency you might be from? Just to say, uh, we've asked the group, the group has agreed to not speak um, okay. on behalf of their constituency at this time. And though, as, as I said, there's statements, one page statements in the report that, that go into that. So I, I just wonder okay. if I can change your question a little bit to ask, the, to ask the group not speaking on behalf of just your constituency, but if there's something you want to say about the report, about the work of the group, about the consensus of the group, the consensus that the group have reached, um, to try and focus on those. So I, I have a question for, for your group. Um, and that's, what do you think the legacy and longevity of your decision will be? And the reason I'm asking that is, what's the shelf life of your decision? Um, could it change um, as the board changes um, in coming years? Well, I think this board is in agreement that uh, whatever decision we make, uh, barring the fact that we continue to run them 100%, that we would have to take this to town meeting in some form or fashion and uh, possibly a vote of the, uh, go to the uh, polls, the electorate. With that being said, if it does go to the polls, the, it would be out of the hands of the Board of Selectmen. It would be in the hands of what the voters actually decide at that point in time. So um, unless we do a phased approach, i.e., you talk about uh, the photovoltaic, take, take one approach of taking them down and then come back with another approach in. That could change. Faces of the Boards of Selectmen can change. Yes, you're right. I don't think that we, I doubt that we as a board will be able to promise that this is the plan for the next 18 years. The town will change, the board of select will change, issues will change, and uh, you know, it is a concern I've had as we've been going through this process with the expectation that we can decide something today and say that's going to be the decision for 18 years. And I don't think we can promise that that's the way it's going to be. Do you mean in the short term, Karen? Like over the next year or two, as we, well, you're not talking about 18 years down the road, a new board's going to say, let's go put up some more wind turbines. Is that, that's not what you, or that's what you're saying? I, I, mean, I can't picture that happening. I can't either. But, but um, I, I have a, can I have an off, off topic question? Why are the REC so much more for solar? Are they? Uh, you could ask that question to Nils. Nils, do you want to answer? Question about the RECs. Why are, why is the, why so are the solar racks worth so much more? Uh, in the, the state 
regulation for the renewable portfolio standard, which creates the demand for RECs, has no carve out set for solar RECs. It creates within that bigger market, it sets up a separate smaller market for solar and says general RECs can be from wind, landfill, gas, uh, biomass, things like that. And they all compete against each other and, and the prices average out around <coughs> 30 to 50 dollars. The solar ones, since they have to have a minimum percentage of just solar, that's what the market demands. Okay, thank you. Just to add briefly to that, um, it, it, it's in, in the simplest terms, the state policy to support renewable energy, solar in particular, has created that structure that Neil's just described to, to encourage the development of photovoltaics. Until that percentage is reached. Until that percentage is reached. Then we no longer have that benefit. Right. Yes. I'm not quite sure how to say this. I'm, I'm thinking you've given us a range of options. So now we have to consider the range of options and, and possibly make a recommendation to town meeting. And that recommendation could include another, I mean, another range of options or the same range of options. And that could also then be... Um, be considered again at the ballot, uh, rather than having one option. And what I'm saying is, we, we could we could carry this forward all the way to the ballot. And I guess, have you given any thought to how you think the electorate may respond to having a range of options or a single option? Have you thought about that at all when you did this? And would you like to comment on it if you have, or maybe not? Time. I'll try to be respectful. <laughs> Do be respectful. Yes. Um, one, no, I haven't thought about too much about how the electorate um, would react to a choice of options, mainly because that's not my job. Um, respectfully, I think it's your job. <clears throat> um, the Board of Selectmen, I think, need to, basically you need to make a choice. You need to, you know, this has gone on for a very long time, and we have all spent a huge amount of effort trying to at least agree on some of the facts. There's still a large amount of information we don't agree on. Um, but these are things we could all basically agree on. And I think it's up to the board to, you know, to step up now and, and make some choices. And in response to that question, I'd be very fearful at the ballot to give conflicting choices. We may end up with something like we ended up at town meeting with a couple of years back, yeah. where there were two votes and they contradicted each other. So you went to the ballot with competing issues. If they both passed, where would you be? Then someone would still have to make a decision. I, I do well, believe, Mr. Chairman, that once this board makes a decision, it, I think it is incumbent upon us to, uh, as we learned in the past, some things we don't sell enough and we pay the price of failing at the ballot box, you know, debt exclusions or whatever. But I think once we make a decision on what we're going to do, that's what we need to really, uh, you know, sell to the, to, the, to the public. So when it goes, I... I just want to say that it could be carefully crafted. Okay. <laughs> it wouldn't be easy, but it could see, be carefully see crafted. Did you want to... I want to just make a general observation about um, having been here um, for every meeting but one and com coming into the process, the, the options, the possibilities, the ideas, the, the, the range was, was mind-boggling. I mean, it was really, there were so many threads and so many possibilities. And the process I think did something very valuable because the, the first time I saw this in on paper in black and white where you could start comparing one option with another option with the photovoltaics with and you can look at the um, economics you can look at the energy production you can look at the um, neighbor impacts in in black and white I, I think you should see this document as a tool because even as I continue to read it, now that it's in, in, in written form, it's much easier to get your brain around. So I would actually, in response to the Chairman's question, encourage you to use this and start thinking creatively about what, 
does make sense because I think a, one of the biggest successes is, is this document because it gets rid of the noise, the things that seemed like great ideas but were just not practical or feasible, and distills what the different you know, possibilities look like really. So. There, there is another possibility, and just to follow up on that is, and the change could happen, is if we come up with a decision and we move forward with that decision, it goes to the ballot and fails. We may have to recraft another solution, one that might be uh, more palatable to different groups. Um, so your question was, would another board be making some decisions? If, if something were not passed at town meeting, this problem would still exist and we would have to revisit it again and find another way to be able to make it palatable. And now, Todd, I think it is, a, it is our job, as you said, I agree with you there. What concerns me a little bit is you guys have spent months and months trying to collect the facts. You've given us some facts, but we're going to have to make a decision not knowing all the facts because they're not known. They're not known by you. They're not known by us, and it, you know, that worries me. We're going to have to do it, but you know, it's going to be based not just on fact because we don't have them all. Yeah. At least the group was able to tell you uh, what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So now you know what you don't know. Uh, you know what you know, and you know what you don't know, and uh, kind of go from there. Jeff. So um, our subgroup here which is made up of Judy and myself and Linda is our alternate. Um, in the process of trying to develop a, a statement of our group, which you s will see in the report, and I'm not going to speak to that, um, we found it helpful to develop a analysis tool, a simple analysis tool, um, which is basically a sort of a two-access type of chart. And um, uh, most of us filled it out for ourselves that, you know, we offered it to our members and, and uh, most of the people um, completed it. Um, and to the extent it might be helpful to you, uh, we offer it to you. You don't have to use it, but um, we found it helpful because it takes a lot to put your mind around uh, those two books in our, in our report here. Um, and uh, it might help you to um, focus really on what we were trying to focus on, which were the core interests as measured against the alternatives. So we have copies if you'd like them later on. I would like them later on. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, on behalf of the group, on, the, on behalf of the process, yeah, not, like, not I'm, your interest. No, no, I like, I'm, I'm curious um, about uh, the process of what has to happen from here, about uh, going, you, going to town, I know it has to go to town meeting, but I don't quite understand uh, why it has to go to the ballot box if the state uh, is implicated in uh, placement of the turbines originally, then doesn't the state uh, have a responsibility to uh, help us out? And I think that's been indicated by uh, both uh, Senate President Therese Murray as well as uh, Energy Secretary um, Rick, Rick, Richard Sullivan. And, and in light of the fact that uh, the Mass CEC has these deep pools of money that I understand are from 130 to 100 to 200 million dollars, um, and from which they were able to to uh, you know, pay uh, almost four hundred thousand for the for our group to develop this report. Uh, I I don't understand why uh, s what between if why selectmen couldn't come up with um, a a, 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 a um, proposal uh, that <coughs> would be financed by the state and just uh, take it to town meeting and say, hey. This is what we we're going to do, 
and this is and the money is going to come from the uh, from the state. So, and, Malcolm, if I could just stop you yeah. for a second, I think, you know, the group discussed, um, and you'll you saw in the summaries, uh, repeatedly requests that uh, recommendations that the board consider um, talking to the state to find resources. So, if I can just uh, summarize that, and you know, you for you to decide the right channels and the people and the agencies and and also the the, the right way to ask the questions right the group uh, agreed that that is really something they they would leave to you right on uh, who do you ask and how do you ask them and what are you asking for and in what ways um, that but 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 certainly uh, there was a strong feeling from the group that to the extent that the solution requires uh, external resources that there was a real hope that you uh, that the town would would approach the state and try to get support Kathy is that no nope. yeah yeah well, um, I'd actually just like to take off the top of what um, Malcolm was saying and could you give us the process that you'll be going forward from here you said that there's a public meeting on Wednesday any additional public meetings the timeline up to town meeting what your deliberation process might be during that time frame reach out that kind of thing well, for everyone to know we started off the meeting by extending this whole process you've given us an entire window of roughly two weeks I mean not that we haven't been thinking this through and most of us have been observing as we can and go forward but we have two weeks to take public comment, deliberate ourselves, because just like you folks, we have differing opinions, and we're going to try to build consensus within the group to find the path that we want to follow. And so we would put an article forward, or hope to put an article forward. Again, we're trying to build consensus too. Uh, February the 4th is the special town meeting. And we have a placeholder there. We also have articles on the regular town meeting that we put on but uh, we'll be putting on. But the goal is to have the article we want for February the 4th. Um, we could amend that article, but you can't change the scope of that article at town meeting. So town meeting would then happen in April. Uh, town meeting is backed up from the ballot because you have to have so many days from town meeting to the elections. That's if it's a funding issue. In answer to your question, um, we cannot assume uh, or that we would get this funding from the state. We can hope and make all due diligence for each and any option that would take or we would require funding to ask the state to participate. But um, I'm sure this group here has some senses of urgency. I know this board does have some senses of urgency. But if we stopped, that would mean we'd either wait for the next election cycle because we don't know again what the state would participate. So I would assume we would go to the ballot with a number not to exceed and then still try to work with the state to try to get them to participate with the town in some form or fashion. That would be what I would say. I, I'm looking for a little bit of insight from the board, but that's the way that I, I, I foresee this unfolding between now and the election. I do, and I think one of the most important elements, I understand town meeting and all, but I really think one of the most important elements is the thing I had mentioned a few months ago, which is the state has to be party at the table with us on this. I really feel strongly about that. And uh, whether this board comes to uh, agreement unanimously on which option, I feel we should take that option and submit it somehow in, in a letter form to the state maybe with all our signatures on it, to show how seriously we need their assistance and, um, you know, request from them any help they can give us. I mean, David Vieira is willing to help us work on this, but I, I really think the state has to. Uh, you know, Pat, you're involved, you have a lot of friends at the state level. You're, well, you think... That's a proper thing to do. I mean, in this well, case, uh, I think we really... I think, I, I think when we do, Decide well. I think we. I agree that yeah. we should do that. 
but when you do go to the state, we have to be very specific about what we want. Right. Yeah. It can't be generalities. It has to be specific and a dollar amount and, and so all of that. So when we come up with an option... We have a delegation that we can work with. Right, and have the hard number. We should really take advantage of that, Mr. Chairman. Right, but we're not yeah. there yet. We've got to figure right. out where we're going to be. Again, as I've always said, everyone has said along the way, go to the state. Well, we have to know what we're going to ask the state for before we can go to the state. You don't just go and say, okay, give us the money. They're going to say, what do you want to do? And we, I think we need to come up with that decision. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, Malcolm, 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 Malcolm. Thanks. Um, so I do hope that the board will, will as, you, as you look, um, will continue to uh, look to members of this group as resources, as you said, um, if you have questions about the information and the options as you go. Um, and to answer Kathy's question about what our immediate timetable is, we're going to have the open meeting next Wednesday. If there's so many people there that we need to have a second open meeting, we will then schedule that. Otherwise, we'll probably have to schedule, you know, we, we may very well have a second open meeting, and then we'll probably have to schedule a separate, a, another meeting for our deliberation, right. in which we probably will not be taking public comment, but trying to deliberate among ourselves. And so we want to get all that public comment on the table so we can then have our, our debate. Well, um, I don't want people to sit out there and think that we're definitely having a second meeting. Right. We only have an hour of, an hour of public comment. Don't put it off to wait till the second right. public comment night, if there is one. We are saying that we are going to give people an opportunity to speak. If it needs to go to another night, we'll do that, because we think it's that important that everyone uh, needs to have their input. We want a robust public comment period. Yes? Is there an opportunity for written comment for you to Yes, there will be as well. Mm -hmm. If there's an opportunity for written comment. I, I can say this, that there has been no topic that I have had more written comment on <laughs> in the eight years that I've served on the Board of Selectmen. So it, it is more welcome, but I mean, um, but there is, I mean, I, I have had a lot of uh, reading over the year, I and mean, I'm sure each and every one of you has as well. Brent wanted to say something. Hey, just a quick question. That Two megawatt solar array, array was suggested. What, why just two? Why not four? Is there a physical limitation? Was what was the limitation there that we that you folks selected two? Sia, do you want to try? Go, on, Sia. <laughs> sure. Um, it was it was space, so you need about you know three to five acres per megawatt, and so the idea was to try and pick a, a size that seemed like you could you could cite it fairly efficiently. Um, clearly, it isn't a replacement of the amount of electricity that the wind turbines produce. That would have required a, and I don't remember the number off the top. 24 acres. Thank 40. you. 20, 24 <laughs> acres and, 20 yeah, million. and $20 million and um, a much, you know, a much larger facility. So this was a, um, I think it was an attempt to have a small array that could be cited efficiently and that could produce a, a break even. I think that the reason for the photovoltaics is to finance the removal of the turbines. And that was the, 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 the reason for it with, with a renewable project. I think I can, I may be responsible for that two megawatt number. Um, I love spreadsheets. And so from the very beginning, I started trying to get a handle on the finances of the project before we had um, the financial guy from uh, SEA involved. And you know, doing some quick calculations of my own, it looked like a two megawatt project would create enough income to pay off some of the debts and things like that. And, and so more than anything, it was just, okay, let's start here and, and see what that does. And just, I think that also gives you a sense, um, you know, we talked about the technical experts that this group had. Um, that does not mean we had people present and they all nodded and then they went home, right? This group er worked extremely actively to make sure that they could all trust um, and rely on the information that they were being given. And in fact, 
you know, we drew so much on the expertise of the members of this group to check, double check, recheck, um, you know, develop new analyses, et cetera. Um, so it really was a very participatory uh, fact finding process that is painful to, and participatory. One other question on the photovoltaic. How much of the lot coverage on that site did the, the photovoltaic that you're proposing take up? In other words, did it take up the entire site of usable area? Space or at, um. Well, the idea is that you need a certain um, acres per, per megawatt, and it's not obviously, they're not butted up against each other. There's space for um, being able to mow grass if you have to. Um, we also did talk about the idea that a distributed facility could also work, so you wouldn't have to necessarily have some farm, some PV farm somewhere on the ground. You could look at roofs, you could look at parking lot arrays, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to site photovoltaics and, and we didn't take that deep dive into the, Is we didn't specific? design the project honestly. Okay. We, we tried to look at it from a financial perspective. And the thing I would say is one of the things that this group asked explicitly of our experts was what would be a break even? Exactly what size array would you need to have a break even? And we didn't get a, gr a straight answer to that in the way that, um, you know, looking back on it, maybe sitting at the same desk with a consultant saying, let's look at this scenario, let's look at that scenario. But I think that, that could be done if the idea was, okay, what would you do to do break even? You'd, you'd want to look at d doing it distributed versus just a ground mounted array. And then you would want to look at different sizes because that two megawatts was a starting point, but you, you could, you could analyze that a little more deeply. I think along those lines, any one of these options is, is really not ready for implementation. <laughs> you know, they're all going to need further development um, along, along the way before they're ready for, for uh, moving forward. Um, but I wanted to ask you um, if you had a sense of along the timeline moving forward, if you had a, a vision of what might happen between February 4th and town meeting or between February 4th and, a, and an election, um, in terms of putting information out to the community to educate them about whatever option you're proposing. And one of the things, you know, is getting more information out is, I mean, between the time we <coughs> have town meeting and the election, you, we have precinct <coughs> meetings, like everyone else goes to precinct meetings and they try to sell whatever they, you know, they to get support, garner support for whatever their particular article is. I mean, I think that's incumbent upon us to do it, plus um, also um, maybe, you know, some written, you know, to educate, because you, you are right, we have, I know everyone's been in this community probably knows about this issue, <coughs> but how much do they actually know? You know, we, but we as a town are limited. Yeah. We cannot use town funds no. to yeah. put for to support or to oppose any article. Yeah. Um, it, and although it would be uh, nice to think that your charge is done tonight, <laughs> in, in fact, I mean, one way or another, the people will be speaking to you as we go down this process. You will be either advocates for or against what we put forward. And we would hope that we're going to put something forward that is palatable to each and every one of you. So it's important that, that what we put forward is something that we think can succeed. Um, we'll also be very candid. There are other competing interests on this ballot. So we have also have to be cautious about what and or if the amount of funds that we're looking for. Um, so um, the board will have to take that in, 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 into line. You still haven't explained though why you have to go to the ballot. You know, um, Stacy, I thought you answered that really carefully. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Stacy threw this through the chair, through the moderator. Yeah. Um, I, could, you, could you explain why you need to go to the we ballot? We don't have the money. Well, <coughs> Malcolm. Um, so I think they, they explained they can't assume money from the state. The state have to request ask. money from the state. Well, they can't ask the state. They can ask the state, but they did. But then they may or may not receive from the state. 
So that, I think, was your, the, and, they, and I think what I heard them say was that the timeline of getting any commitment from the state may be longer than the timeline for getting to the ballot. And so um, even if the, there's the potential the state might give them all the money they need, uh, unless they want to risk having to wait a whole nother year for the ballot, um, then it may make sense to go to the ballot uh, just in case with a not to exceed number. Is that correct, what I heard? Anything else from the Board of Selectmen? Okay, so with that, with that, um, unless it's on I the just have a general group as a whole. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to put out to this board that if you are seeking more information, that I hope you'll feel free to contact us. I hope that you know that we can observe all of the open meeting laws and at the same time have some communication if you have needs to understand something in here because. The people sitting at this table probably know the most about these issues more than anyone else in town. And people in town don't really understand the issues. Um, so I hope you'll use this resource. I hope you'll pick up the phone or whatever, the email, to tap into the people at this table. Thanks. Karen. I, I just want to, um, to affirm that, Kathy, that uh, I think I've heard many times from many of us, and I know I felt this way myself, that I, I came with uh, some assumptions, thinking I knew a few things that were totally incorrect. Um, and so uh, the process of going through this and looking at this data has been a tremendous education, I think, to each of us here. And um, without doing some of that for the community, um, it, it really will be uh, very di difficult for people to make an educated decision based on fact. They'll, they'll make it on the assumptions they currently have, but I can tell you from all of us here that many, many of our assumptions were incorrect. Do we have, uh, if any member of this board does want to reach out, do we have the contact information for the members as in a certain so the contact information is one of the appendices, and it's, it? okay. um, and it's on our website, but I can direct you to it uh, okay. they very have it specifically. In the they have it gotcha. in your office. Yeah. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, with that, maybe I hand it back to you to adjourn. Um, yes, uh, we would adjourn, but again, uh, just so that folks know, next Wednesday evening, 7.30 in the Board of Selectmen's room. 6.30. 6.30, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the meeting will be devoted to... Uh, um, strictly public comment that evening. There will be no votes. Uh, the Board of Selectmen will not even be discussing our options at that point in time. That evening we'll be just gaining information uh, as much as we can from uh, those folks who at the public hearing. The Board of Selectmen may ask the folks who are making comments questions, but uh, we will not be debating the direction that we're going on that evening. Okay? Uh, yeah. Concerning that evening, if I could just at this time, publicly apologize. I will not be at that meeting. I'm on the superintendent uh, sur uh, search committee, and I made that commitment quite a while ago. Uh, our board discussed many times as to what night we could do that, and because I've been through this process a little bit, that was the reason why I was the one that was kicked out and said, well, we're going to sacrifice you for it. Um, but I certainly will be watching on TV and happy to get the public uh, comment. But if you wonder why I'm not there, I just want to make clear that uh, it's not because I've given up or don't care. Yes, Mel. Yeah, a number of people that have come to us in town have come up to me and they've uh, asked uh, if, uh, why, uh, why is, the, uh, is the process being rushed uh, in light of the fact that you had once spoken about having a special town meeting uh, just to discuss this issue and they were wondering, uh, seeing that it would probably entail a lot of discussion on town meeting floor that you know that might be a, a, a smart way to do it anyway it would be a smart way to do it on town meeting floor Doug, 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 Doug gave up we talked about a special having a special town meeting just for this just issue. For this. It, that's correct and that's if we needed a special town meeting we believe that we can make the deadlines for the regular town meeting 
And again, we have an election coming. We do have a fiduciary responsibility to the folks in this community to try to eliminate having two elections. One would be just a ballot question for this or a question that when the people go to the polls in this community. The other scenario is when people go to the polls, there will be two seats in the Board of Selectmen as well as multiple seats in town meeting members and things of that nature. The turnout would be much better. We'll actually get a, a, a greater turnout versus something for a one-question article. And Mr. Chair, if I can also reiterate what this board said, and this is before I was on the board, that this process had a commitment to have this issue resolved by this spring town meeting. We can't, we won't do anything good to do a special town meeting before town meeting because that doesn't help our timetable. To do it afterwards will not have the board sticking to what they agreed to. That would be a special town meeting after the time in which they said we will do you know we do what we can to have a decision by the springtime meeting and i think that we're really doing everything we can to stick to that uh, the agreement we made from the very beginning and, and the window is very close after town meeting there has to be a certain number of days between the town meeting and the election there has to be that amount of time okay okay um, i think what's going to be important in town meeting is that um, town meeting members and everyone in town understand that appropriate time is going to be given for debate. Um, I know that last year we kind of had the debate. There was some cutoff. There were some things that occurred. We had the double vote that everyone understand that we're given kind of maybe not a slot, but an understanding that time will be given for an explanation, presentations, and that type of time at town meeting, whether it's during the second night or even a third night, but that that due time is given during those two to three days for this and not rushed into the last 20 minutes of the second night or something like that. It's just worth consideration, we, I think. We can, we can surely uh, encourage the moderator, but the moderator runs that show. I will say to you that town meeting, very many people walk into town meeting and they've already been educated on the issues or should have at least been educated on the issues. Town meetings should really occur at every one of those precinct meetings. There's nine of those precinct meetings, and every controversial subject <coughs> has an opportunity for presentations at those precinct meetings. And that's where to really be educated. It's just to, to ice the cake at town meeting. To, to be, uh, and, and we will encourage him to take as much time as possible. But to think that we're talking to the voters, we're only talking to really 230 people, at town meeting. Those are the ones that are going to make that decision there. Okay. So we're, town meeting is dessert? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think it was the meat and potatoes. Uh, <laughs> well, it is, they, but the town meeting members get to go before and, and find out, or should at least find or out. Or you're observed precinct. Okay. Right. <laughs> All right. If, if there's no other dis uh, questions. Yeah, I'm going to have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's hy a hypothetical question for selectmen. Should uh, the selectmen sit, uh, develop a uh, read this and take whatever or other and do their deliberations and come up with a proposal and turn around and uh, ask the state to fund that proposal? And if the state said yes, we will fund that proposal, would there still be a need to go to the ballot box? Not if they got um, I think a lot would depend on timing, Malcolm, because um, our intent with this whole process was to try to gather information and come up with solutions and, and come to a resolution as quickly as possible, respecting the fact that many of the neighbors have raised issues for a considerable amount of time and would like to see these issues resolved long ago. Um, even if the state were to come to us between, say, let's say during town meeting, we come to a decision, everybody votes and says, yes, we'll go ahead with whatever option that might cost X number of dollars. And then before we get to the ballot box, the state says, sure, we'll fund that for you. Well, the state may put stipulations on it and say, we'll fund it for you, but we won't have the money until next fiscal year. Or it's going to be a few months because we have to have a special session to get that money. There are so many variables involved that what we don't want to do is put things off um, because we're afraid of what the town might vote or might not vote. 
Um, ultimately, as, as was said a few times already, we're going to have to make a decision and we're going to have to support that decision and sell that decision. Um, if it requires funding of some sort, we really do need to come to the people of Falmouth and make sure we have that available to us without hoping that the state will give us the money within a certain period of time or even at all. If I think obviously if the state were to say, yes, we'll fund it, but we can't give you the money until next year, we have a much better chance of having it passed at the ballot box with the people knowing that, hey, we're going to be refunded next year, so let's move ahead with this process. Um, but if the state doesn't pony up the money, do we want to risk delaying this process further with the hope that maybe we'll come up with a solution next year? Um, you know, I don't want to take that chance, honestly. The state might possibly also want to see what the folks in this community, not the five just here, <coughs> what they say at the ballot. So we, we can't get into their minds. I'm sure there will be some talks with this board or, 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 or our management between when we submit the article and town meeting. We can begin those talks. Can I ask a question through the chair? Mm -hmm. if if the, there was something on the ballot for a debt exclusion that passes <coughs> and then later aid was found in some way, shape, or form, is what you suggested, what Brent suggested about once you've got a two and a half override commitment, is it possible to give that back and, and take away that override after? We would look at it in a, in a means, as I said, not to exceed. So, in other words, we wouldn't borrow the money if we got it from the state. Mm -hmm. It would pass at the ballot. Either that or we would pay off the bond with the money we got from the state for that. It, it, yep. Just an addendum to that. Another possibility, too, is that we pursue an option that costs, say, $2 million, and the state says, all right, we'll pony up a $1 million. And again, we would still have to get the money from the people in some way, shape, or form in order to deal with our contribution to that solution. So, there, like I said, there are a lot of variables here, and honestly, we have to try to adhere to this timeline and ask town meeting for its support for whatever decision that we put forward, and then, if necessary, ask the people for that support as well. I, I will add one thing. Um, what we need to focus on is the short-term goals. If we look at just the ballot box between now and February the 4th, we're going to lose sight of what we need to put on the ballot. So this board needs to be focused on that first. Then we have a window to breathe between then and town meeting. And uh, we'll have an opportunity to engage the state if we, uh, if we come up with a solution that needs money. Still not there yet. We haven't made those decisions. OK. okay. Uh, like to look for a motion to adjourn from the so board? Moved. Motion? Second. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Close. Yeah, I Thank you very much, every one of you.